times I'm gonna sign it and photos at a con. Really? The inaugural, your first time ever, really? Not first time at a con, but I've always been here like doing a promotion, so I'll come in and do a panel and then leave, but to actually be here sitting at a table and meeting all the fans, it was so much fun. Everyone is so nice, yeah. I love it, I love it. I'm here for all the kids. Are you gonna have any time to get to actually explore this city? I am not, sadly. I'm here right now. From the crowd. I know, I wish I was, but you know, if you guys want to see Thanksgiving too, somebody has to write it. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to come here, but you know, daddy needs to get home and ride. <laughs> and he thank you so much for it. Thanksgiving is absolutely wonderful, so incredible. Thank you for ruining the holiday for me forever. Weirdly, it's great. It's, I always hope that it would be like Elf or Nightmare Before Christmas, and you know they put it back out. And, and they're like, I saw a thing on Reddit that said I'm back in theaters. So like, let me check. They're like, yeah, you're back in 500 theaters. It's like, why? I don't just really know. Someone at exhibition just put us back in. But the joke when I made the fake trailer was that those movies always came out not on the holiday. It was always like, okay, just kidding. This February. <laughs> so today is, it's like, it's actually February and it's back in theaters. It's like, so, but it's also, you know, a lot of people got the Blu ray, which is cool. It's on a Blu ray, finally came out on Blu ray this week and on, you know, it's on streaming and everything. So yeah, you can go see the big screen by yourself, probably, but it's still fun. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Absolutely. So when you did the initial one, was there always a plan for a sequel? Uh, the first Thanksgiving, you know, whenever you make a movie, part of your sales pitch, if you're trying to look, it's very hard to get a new original property out there. And thank you guys for seeing it, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do more. But um, so when you, when you go to, the, to Spyglass and Sony and people were like, they're like, okay, well, but can you continue it? You have to go, yeah, yeah, of course, I've got a whole plan. And you're like, oh, it's <laughs> um, so in the back of your mind, anytime you're sort of selling the concept of doing a new movie, you can't just go, yeah, we're just going to do one. Nobody wants that anymore. You go, look at screen six, we made 150 million guys, we could get to number six. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you're kind of, they're buying into the idea. And I always say, like, if it works, I will continue it. That's my promise. I don't want to just... I've learned that if I if I leave it, it sort of goes awry. So I was like, let me at least do one, hope it does well, then I'll definitely do the second one. But you gotta kind of let them know that you're gonna be kind of creatively involved. But yeah, the, 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 the whole time we were shooting, we are thinking, you're not thinking, yeah, in the second one, we're gonna do this. We're like, there is only this. There can be only one. There's only one movie. If it never gets to do another one, at least I got to make this one, and you just gotta go balls out like you're never gonna get to drive again. And then thankfully it did well enough that we can do another one. And the kills are so beautifully creative. I love your mind. Like, where does it come from, Eli? I love that you said they were beautiful while following your eyes. All I ever wanted in life. Um, no, I think they're beautiful too. I don't see them as gross or boring. I'm like, oh, look at the way the blood splatter. <laughs> the way the intestines hang out and the skin ripped off and the face on the frozen through a freezer door. Um, I always, I, I, I have like a very, you know, strange mind. I had it studied for a Discovery Channel, and they're like, your brain is like a one in a thousand brain. Like, Basically, most brains are going like this, and then they see something crazy, and they're like that. I'm like at this all the time, and I can't turn it off. There's no off switch. It's just like having a million channels on at once. So when there's something super violent, my frontal lobe shuts out. Like, I don't process movie violence, like real violence. Of course, I get upset. I'm not like a sociopath, but the, that was like, I mean, you're like a, you're like a part-time sociopath. You're like a fully functioning psychotic. I'm like, what? He goes, no, no, it's good. You're like Don Corleone or someone like, I was like, wait, wait, wait. And, and this guy, Dr. Jim Fallon, this neuropsychiatrist, they put me in an MRI machine. They splashed, it was like clockwork orange. They put like a million images in front of my eyes, like blueberries, a war, a hammer, a sidewalk, just like random shit. It's like, ch -ch 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 -ch. And they were just measuring my brain, not even emotional response. 
it was like three hours in a tube looking at stuff. Because um, I wanted to know, like, why do I think of this? Why do, why am I? Because I assume everybody's thinking it. And even when we're in Thanksgiving, we're filming the scene of her roasting in the oven. I'm just like, oh my God, this is so cool. And she like, ah! and, and someone came up to me, they're like, this is too much, this is too much. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I'm like, but I feel like roasting her skin off. <laughs> like, there's no bone, it's not like seeing her jaw, like, we're, we're gonna, and then we're like peeling her and peeling her and peeling her. Well, we showed it to an audience, and the audience got mad at me, <laughs> because it turned, it just got, like, turned into cruelty. People were like, we're not here for this. The first deaths with the decapitation and feeding the cat, like, they're so fun. That I sort of steered, I like tricked the audience, like, ha ha, we thought this was gonna be fun, but now we're back in Hostel 3. You know, like, it's like, and you think that's what the audience wanted, but you can't do that for an hour and then suddenly switch the tone of the film. So I pulled it back a little, and then people were back to applauding and cheering. So to answer your question in a very long winded way, I'm always gonna, like, my brain will always think of, like, oh, that's fucked up. Like, what's sick? What are you not supposed to do? Like, yeah. oh, okay, like, he puts her head in the water. And then I'm like, wouldn't it be funny if he just stuck her face to the freezer and then just, like, casually went to get the edge? She's not going anywhere unless she rips her face off and her fingertips. But it's like, if you just tore half your face off and your fingertips, what would you do? You try and do a phone. And I've always wanted to have someone, their fingers bleeding, try to use a phone and be like, what? Like, the squeaky noise, like you can't open your phone, oh, you hold it up to your face. Oh no, she has no face. <laughs> like, I'm just laughing, thinking of that stuff. Watching someone get mad, like you're just, and when we showed it to an audience, you could see people were like, oh, she's gonna call 911, oh, she can't use her phone. And then you could feel the audience catching up going, use it, oh no, 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 like, like they were ready to go, she's gotta use her face, no, she has no face. Like, that to me is what, it's, it's like, here's how I think, what have I seen? I've seen decapitations, I've seen people get killed, but anytime I'm watching a horror movie and there's a pet, if the owner of that pet gets killed, I can't enjoy the movie until I know the pet's okay. I can't, and even though I know it's fake, and I'm not trying to sound like all goody-goody, like I'm an alien, I didn't give a fuck about anyone in the ship, I was only concerned if the cat made it out. <laughs> Everybody could die as far as I'm concerned. Jones the cat had better live. And so, I watch a movie where, you know, we decapitate them and I'm like, okay, the, the difference between me and everyone else is I'm going to take the time. If the killer's like about to leave and he's like, and he looks back and I'm like, <sighs> it's just that moment and he just feeds the cat and pets the cat. And from that moment on, everyone's like, oh, fuck the people. I'm <laughs> it's like, save the cat. It's like the most basic, it's putting my sick horror twist on what is like the most obvious, there's a book called Save the Cat, about like, if you want to get people to like your characters, Save the Cat, and the director of Rocky, every movie, he would have his main character feed a pet, because he's like, that's how you get people to like, like they love the characters, and he's like, feeding an animal, it's like, but doing it in the context of, I just chopped someone's head off, but I'm like, I got nothing against the cat, so I'm gonna feed the cat. Like that's, that's how I like to think of what have I never seen before, and what have I always wanted to do in a horror movie? And how can I take what is a basic trope of slasher movies and make it so unique, it feels fresh. Amazing. What a cool brain. <laughs> Thank you. I was resoundingly mocked for a long time and like very low on the high school list of guys that, to date. So it's, it's very nice that like people appreciate now, when I'm married, it doesn't matter. But it's fun. Look, it's fun. I, I was like, for a while, people were just like, all I ever heard was, what's wrong with you? What the fuck's wrong with you? So it's nice that like, I could channel it into something. People were like, oh, that was great. Uh, so obviously, you've worked with a lot of different films with different budgets. So I wanted to know, how do you approach a film when you have like a smaller budget versus a huge blockbuster film? That's a great question. You know, budget, every story kind of has their own budget. I, I, I produced the movies as well, so I always kind of build myself into a box and go, fuck. What was I thinking? I promised everyone I could do this and I need more money. Shit. So, but that happens no matter whether you're on Cabin Fever, which is a million and a half dollars, or Borderlands, which is a lot. Of money. Um, yeah. You're always, there's never enough money. So, and it, it really is about like being 
being able to improvise, you know, someone I attributed a quote to Kubrick, I've never found it written, but the, apparently the quote is, making a movie is having a vision and compromising a 100%. And I'm like, oh, that's accurate. That's what it's like. Unless you're doing animation, drawing every frame. You know, like with, with Thanksgiving, which the budget was 15 million, um, it was enough where I wanted it to look and feel like screen, where it's a big movie, you could do parade scenes, lots of extras, but tons of characters, but it was a 30-day shoot. It was still really fast. So the riot scene, we had four nights to shoot the whole thing. Two nights outside, the kids pulling up and arriving. Two nights inside, the trampling and all the, you know, head smashing of the shopping cart. So it was a lot, so you planned the hell out of it. But I, I think that it's just a mindset. If you go in, I go, all right, basically they're like, for Thanksgiving, we'll give you 15 million for this script, if you want to change things within that, do whatever you want, but you split it up however you feel you need to, which is how I like to work. Hostel, I was like, I can make this move. I was gonna do it for three, and then we got 3.8 million. And I was like, 3.8 million was like, yeah, we're shooting this movie, we're shooting in Prague. 35, I think it was 42 days, like six day weeks, it was a lot. It was, it was a fast shoot, but you know, I knew that if I kept the budget under five million, the investors would make their money back, because back then you could make it back up on TVD sales. So, you know, when you're doing a movie like Borderlands, it's a much longer process. You do more pre-vis, it's a, it's a lot longer post-production, because it's so much with visual effects. It's been a year just doing visual effects. Um, and then, you know, it, it was nice to get back to doing uh, a movie like Thanksgiving with practical effects where you're, you know, there was, there was definitely some CGI in it, but you wouldn't notice it. It was all like kind of repairing and painting out strings and puppeteering and stuff like that. So I like practical makeup effects. Adrian Moreau was amazing, did the gore, did the whale, he won the Oscar on that. So it's really just basically, I find as the producer, it's best to be super upfront. I don't tell them what the number is, I'm just like, guys, we're, we're doing this for nothing, but we're all doing it for scale, or everyone's doing it low but we're gonna have the fucking time of our lives and we're gonna make it classic. So if you wanna get paid, go do Instagram posts, you know, you tell the cast, like, go do promo shit. They can make so much more money promoting shit on Instagram than doing a low-budget movie. So you tell them, but when you're doing a low-budget movie, you tell them up front, like, we're all getting the same, we're all doing this, but, like, we're gonna make, you're gonna reinvent yourself as an actor. You're gonna not be the Disney star anymore. You're not gonna be a social star anymore. You're gonna, this is okay, you did this TV, this is your breakout role, and everyone benefits. You know, it's, it can be a career changer for all of them. And they're all fantastic. And with the crew, you go, this is how much money we have, this is what I want to do, what do you think? And they're like, well, I would put your money into this, we could probably pull this off. This is turning into, a, we could just go, okay, this idea is getting really expensive. Let's just drop it. And the truth is, what does everyone remember? Fucking corn holders in the ears. It's the cheapest gag. I just did it in reverse, and then just reversed it. So it's just getting Jenna to act, and you're like, you're just, and we're just like, ah, you go like, action, ah, ah, so oh, just front, ah, ah. And then we like stop it and play the film back, we're like, nope, the timing's off. And we got it seven times we did it. And on take seven, everyone went, ah, and then we got it. So that's the great thing about horror. The beautiful thing is that, you know, you can do it whether it's Skin of a or Talk to Me or When Evil Lurks. There are movies that come out every year and they go, wow, they pulled it off and they just did it because it was a scary idea. So that's the great thing about horror is you have to be clever and creative and, you know, really find cheap ways to make it work. And if, if you can make it scary and pull it off, then the audience is there. So before we get to the questions from the crowd, I wanted to ask you, for when we do go watch Thanksgiving again in theaters, what's your go-to movie snack? I love Junior Mints. I like the smash <laughs> like, like, and eat it with the triangular shape. Yeah, like, uh, like Junior Mints, I, mean, I get very addicted. And I know your breath is gonna be good after you eat them. <laughs> but I like the texture, I like the flavor. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll eat popcorn all the time, I like raisinets, but I get tired of it. But if there's a huge box of Junior Mints, I don't even want to share them. And I like at the end when they all sort of smash into one Junior Mint thing, and you just have to go and like, scoop it, and like eat it off one of them. 
where like I'm opening the inside of the box, I'm just like shooting the bottom. I'm like, Junior gets really, really gets smashed down by the end of the movie, and they make this sort of blob of Junior that I love. Just still make that beautiful picture and description of Junior Mints. Although Randell and I were fuckheads when we were kids, we used to go and like buy Juju beads, which we hated, but we would lick them because they were so sticky, and then we would throw them in. Stick them in people's hair. <laughs> if we hated the movie and we wanted to get thrown out, or we hated the people at the movie, and we'd, or if we'd snuck into the movie, we paid for another movie, but movie hopped into that one. This is when we were like 12 years old. We were like an absolute, we were terrorists at the cinema. <laughs> well, we're going to go to questions for the crowd. You're up first, what's your name? What's your question? Uh, I'm Ryan. And I am a big Borderlands fan, and I was wondering if you could give us maybe an update on the movie, maybe when a trailer might come out. Um, hey Ryan, nice to meet you, man. I'm, I'm so excited about Borderlands, but we know the movie's coming out August 9th, and Lionsgate has specifically asked me to like hold off on talking about it while they finalize things like the trailer date and when stuff's gonna drop. They're, they're like planning, they're, they're almost about to present me with a whole calendar, and that's when they're like, okay, go full steam. Because they know, as soon as I mention it, it winds up the whole, the sites, and they don't want it to kind of burn out the news on it. But we should have updates very soon. They haven't updated me yet, because they probably know I'll run my mouth. But uh, I'm so excited for you guys to see it, we really, I think very lovingly built and recreated the world of Pandora with everyone in Gearbox. It's, uh, it really, it's, it, it looks like you're in the game. It's wild. Thank you. My name's Joseph, and I just want to say what a pleasure it is to have you here at the MegaCon, Mr. Roth. Thank you, Joseph. And, and before, I say my, before I say my question, I just want to say, in my opinion, you are the coolest actor that knows how to use a baseball bat in a movie. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, it was probably me and, what, Bernie Mac and Senator Tom Selden's baseball, but thank you. And my question is for you, what was your favorite part about just directing and having a part in the house with the clock in its walls? Oh wow, didn't see that one coming. I love it. The clock in its walls was, look, I, I wanted to, make gateway horror. You know, I had done so much violent, R-rated horror stuff, which I obviously love, but my brothers and my friends, everyone is kids that are my age, because I'm old now, and they're like, when are you gonna make something that I can take my kid to? And I remember that experience. You know, my brothers, they love Beetlejuice. That's it, like, Beetlejuice is the only, and as we all do. But I realized that there were fewer and fewer true, pure PG movies. Not PG-13, not G, but the PG horror movie felt like kind of a lost art form. And I grew up on those Amblin movies, and those Goonies, those movies that were just, when you're eight, nine, ten years old, that were just scary enough, but still safe enough, but fun. But you could give children the thrill of a scary movie without traumatizing them and, and having all that stuff in there. So Eric Kripke, who created, you know, created The Boys, and Supernatural, had written a terrific script um, from the John Belair's book. And, you know, the opportunity came up for me to direct it, and I just jumped at it because I said, you know, I, they had Kate Blanchett attached, and I, I met with Kate, and she, we really, really clicked. And, First time I met Kate, she told me like she loved Evil Dead, Escape from New York. I couldn't believe it. She's a huge horror movie fan. She'd never done anything like it. And then I went to, you know, I wanted Jack Black, and I think that Jack and Kate were such a dynamic combo because Kate's really funny. And Jack brought out the funny in Kate. And Jack's a brilliant dramatic actor. And Kate brought out Jack's best dramatic acting. They were like, and Owen Vaccaro and all the kids in the show. And look, Kyle McLaughlin, or maybe Lisa Goldsberg, it's an amazing cast. So it was, uh, I got to do that Amblin movie with that Amblin magic. It was, it was surreal and wild, and I got to edit at Amblin and be there. I just wanted to live and breathe in that world. Um, it was, it was wild. I mean, just for me, that is, that whole experience of getting to do a period movie. Remember, we had New Zebedee set up in, you know, 1956, and I got to put Spaceman from Pluto on Marquee, which, of course, was the fake title of Back to the Future <laughs> when they were making it. And so it was just fun to have everyone dressed up in that world in that period and to have, like, kids really like it and, and have that be their first scary movie. 
Their second one should be hostile too. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, you did such a phenomenal job directing that, and it's one of my go-to movies. If I, if I want to watch something dark at my house on the, the, for a movie, it's one of my movies I watch is The House with the Pockets Walls. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're your mix, of course. All right, go ahead. Did you get it? Hi, how are you, Eli? My name is Marcel. Nice to meet you. I know, good to see you. Good to see you. So, I was wondering, as a big fan of the Scream franchise, more specifically Scream 3, I was wondering if Patrick Dempsey's role in that movie, um, yeah. whether his performance had any influence on his role in your movie? Weirdly, no. And I'm, I'm really being honest. I saw Scream 3 when it came out, but it's not a movie that I remember. And someone's like, you know he's in Scream 3, right? And so I'm sure it's like somewhere in the database, but basically Patrick approached me, his agent approached me and said, Patrick really wants to do a horror movie. And I was like, I mean, oh my God, if we fucking killed that Patrick in this movie, are you, are you, like, could we really get Patrick Dempsey? Like, don't fuck with me. And they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> These teenage boys, and they were like, love horror, and they wanted, like, Dad, you gotta do a horror movie. Um, so it was just that moment, you know, Patrick's at this incredible moment in his career where you look at those actors like the Paul Newman or the Clint Eastwoods, and when Clint Eastwood started doing Dirty Harry, and suddenly he's not the guy from the Spaghetti Westerns, he's the fucking badass cop. And Dempsey, first of all, very sexy. Sexy man. <laughs> the sexiest person in America versus time. It's true. <laughs> you did. That was you. I, I take full credit. <laughs> um, no, Patrick was Patrick was great. Like he's look. I grew in high school. I saw him in romantic comedies, and everyone grew up with him on, you know, seeing him in Grey's Anatomy and romantic comedies. But now it's like. Thanksgiving and Ferrari, I mean, this guy, you know, could be like doing movies for the next 30 years, he's 40 years, he's, he's such a good actor, and he looks great, and he's the coolest dude, and he just fucking nails it every take, he always brings something interesting, he's so charming, and lights up the screen, he's, he's a real star, so, no, I appreciate that, I think we're at Rocky Horror Picture Show, what's happening, no, it's, um, but yeah, Patrick is a, uh, He's a, he's a great dude, and it was just him reaching out to me, and that's why I cast him. I wasn't like, I mean, I remember Scream 3, but it wasn't one of the movies that I was like super, weirdly, super conscious of while I was making. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, hi, Richard. Good afternoon, Mr. Rob. Um, my name is Storm. I was curious, is there a horror trope that you enjoy seeing, or you just wish you would see more often? Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm a fan of the jump scare. Doing those are tricky when you when you get one, but I love the slasher POV opening on a house. That's why I did it. Like it, it just to me when I see that, I know I'm in a horror movie. As a kid, whenever like Black Friday, student bodies, even De Palma did it in Blowout. Remember that opening shot? He's out by the tree and shows the sorority house and just approaching you. The, the like whenever there's a POV watching a house, I'm like. I, I'm in the movie. To me, the movie has started, and that's what I like. Try. That's what I like in horror films to try to do. That kind of even from the like titles or whatever the logos of the studio are. From the moment a light projection happens and you hear the sound, you're in it right through the end of the credits. Like it wants to be like a pure experience. So I have to go to the logos. They're like, you know, can I take that out and put in my own score? So. I just want, like, by the time you get to that first shot, the audience is quiet and tense. I love, but I love when you start of a POV and it's like something unsettling and creepy. You know you're in a scary movie. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Hell yeah, dude. Hi, uh, my name's Jonathan. Uh, I like uh, writing movies, and I find that the plot is the easy part. The dialogue is where I really uh, struggle. Uh, are there things that are in the movies you've watched that you find that? If you're struggling, do you go back on them to kind of see, to get inspiration for it to, to help you? Yeah, I mean, like, David Mamet wrote a really good book on directing. It's called On Directing, where he talks about that. He's a brilliant writer, but he talks about how people don't speak in text, they speak in subtext. And they're like, yeah, and he's like, if you, if you want to, you know, he's like, if you want to get a girl in bed, you don't say, in the book it says, you know, I want to have sex with you, you go, that's a pretty dress. Like, you, you think about the character, it's an example of 
character's objective, what they want, and how they go about getting it, you know, distinct to their own personalities. But in terms of dialogue, I think what might help you is you can't think that's the boyfriend, that's the girlfriend, that's the dad, that's what do, what do they say now? You have to really know who they are and what they want. And why are they there in that room and what is their objective? Everybody's trying to get something. You know, I'm trying, you guys are trying to get your questions answered. I'm trying to answer in a fun, entertaining way. You're trying to listen to the answers and the questions and keep the conversation moving. But we're all here to have like an entertaining, informative, fun Q&A. But everyone's got their little sub-objectives within it. So it's thinking about, it's easy sometimes when you write a character with your friends or people you knew or a bully from high school because, you know, when a dog walks through, when a chicken walks through, when a parent comes in, when someone you like comes in, everyone's going to react different, but every friend is going to have a variation of that reaction. So I think it's, it's really, if you're having trouble writing the dialogue, it's, the trouble is probably that you haven't really figured out who your characters are. And once you know your characters and their backstory and their history, not like, oh, this one worked at a convenience store, or this one dropped out of high school, but really know them, who their parents are, what their upbringing is, you've got to go that deep. What their economic status is, whether they were poor or wealthy or middle class, and whether the parents are divorced or remarried, they have siblings. This is every single character in your movie. Once you know that, the characters just start talking, and you just kind of hear them in your head. And when that happens, then you're transcribing, you're not writing. And when you sit down at your computer, it never works. You can write longhand, take a pen and paper, or you can have like a notes in your iPhone of just random dialogue or use Trello. But like, I'm telling you, the best writing is when like some asshole takes your part in space at Whole Foods. <laughs> you think of a million ways to kill them. And then after when you're driving home, you won't even be there. You'll be thinking of all the things you should have said when you saw them in the checkout line. That's when you need to write it down. And you're like, oh, this is exactly what the character says this, this is that scene. And then it just starts to flow. And then you, but like when your characters start talking, you may have to like pull over the car and just like in a trance write down what they're saying. And once you do that enough, you start to get to know them. And then once you really know your characters, then you, they can kind of go on the journey. Yeah, I kind of know when I'm at work, I'm talking to my head and I pull up my phone real quick. So, thank you for that. Out and ready, or just have like a yellow legal pad with a thing with the better. Because <laughs> they're not going to come back. Right. Thank you so Gotta much. Gotta get them when they're talking. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Eli. My name is Matt. It's a real pleasure to uh, see you here in person. Thanks, Matt. Um, so, for as much fun as I have watching your films, I have just as much fun hearing you speak about films. Uh, whether it's on your uh, history of horror program, uh, the various interviews you give, or my personal favorite, your appearances with Joe Bob Briggs on The Last Drive. And, um, Joe Bob. So what I wanted to ask is, from you and people like you, I've learned so much about the genre. I'm a bit of a latecomer to horror. I was a scaredy cat as a teen that come around to it. There's whole subgenres I wouldn't have explored without you know learning about it from you. So when you were coming up and getting into horror, were there any particular figures, be it filmmakers, writers, or horror hosts like Joe Bob, uh, that helped give you your horror education? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I grew up you know, in the 70s and 80s, and they had these, every town had their local horror host. And the late night, kind of the midnight movie, were always the cheapest slots. And the TV stations needed to fill them. The TV used to go off the air at 2 a.m. until 1 a.m. And, but that midnight show, they're on the local channel, they would buy some kind of package and they would just put crazy fucking movies on. But every town had a local person that would dress up. That's how, you know, Elvira started and Vampirella and all these things. We had the Lenny Clark show in Boston. This guy, Lenny Clark, who would come on Saturday nights at midnight. He's like local mass hole guy. He's like, welcome to the Lenny Clark show. He was like a Boston comedian who would show, he's like, tonight you're gonna watch Son of the Blob. 
here's why it's funny. It's because it's fucking badass. It's his kid. You know, he just would take you through it. And we had Elvira, movie macabre, where Elvira was on the sexy Cassandra Peterson, who was, of course, out of Ground Lakes. And she had John Paragon, who was jumping on Pee Playhouse, but he was the breather. You're like, oh, he's like, hey, Elvira. And the breather would call in, and he would always tell, like, a stupid knock knock joke to Elvira. But she would take you through these movies. So you, you'd watch these films. There, there were, like, there was a guy named Dana Percy who had a show called The Movie Loft in Boston, and he would show, like, Deer Hunter and, you know, Pop Up Snap, but he would also show, like, really good, weird horror films every now and then. So these horror hosts were the people that you looked to, and then it was buying books, you know, Pauline Kael's Thousand One Nights in the Movies, and there was a book called, you know, Splatter Movies by John McCarty that was like, you just could buy these books, and getting Fangoria Magazine, reading Fangoria. Fangoria became my Bible, so, it was once a month, or there were 10 issues a year, or I'd go to Newbury Comics in Boston and save up my money and buy an old back issue which had Scanners or Motel Hell, or, you know, you would just go through and read these interviews with Sam Raimi and Joe Dante and all, all these, you know, Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, John Carpenter, but you really, really had to search it out. It was fucking hard to find that stuff. And then a lot of that stuff wasn't released on DVD. I remember Demons was demonic, it was like some kid in school would be like, have you seen this movie Demons? They didn't tell you it's an Italian film made by Lumberto Bottle and used by Gobble because in the 80s, the Italian directors used to change their names. When once, when Good, the Bad, the Ugly came out, it was directed by like Bob Robertson, that's in the trailer, it did not say Sergio Leone. They were trying to trick audiences into thinking that they were American films. So they were European actors, all dubbed, by like the same two or three people speaking English. So if you watch those old Fulci films, like New York, like, yeah, like every cop talks like this. It was the same guy. It's like, oh, really? Yeah, right. It's like the same three actors. So you're like, directed by Louis Coates. It was Luigi Cozzi. So it really wasn't until DVD came out and IMDb came out that you could start to kind of discern who actually directed these movies. Then they were like lovingly retransferred and companies like Arrow and Synapse and Woo! Syndrome and 88 Films would finally get the original negative uh, and transfer it. But back then, you just kind of had to go to the comic book store and it was literally comic book guys shaming you for not knowing as much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting the five minutes. All right, we have time for one more question then. Go ahead, would you already? Um, hi, my name is Jenna and I had a question about Hostel 2. Um, one of my favorites uh, favorite sequences that I've seen you direct is actually not a gore scene, but rather a chase scene where Beth is in the pool and everyone around her disappears all of a sudden and then she is soon after captured. I was just wondering what directing that sequence was like, especially the zoom in shot and then everyone's gone. Oh, thank you. Um, I shot that in Iceland as an excuse to go to Iceland for no fucking reason. I was like, this is the most gratuitous boondoggle of my career. Um, and we went there, and we got permission to film at the Blue Lagoon, where I'd been when I was 19. And I went back, and it's just one of the most beautiful, magical places on Earth. And I thought, and I remember that day was very stressful because it was, I mean, we were shooting there in November, end of November, and there's very little daylight then in the winter anyways. But the only shootable light, it was so overcast and so foggy, by like 11.30, we were like, oh, can we even film? Because we're shooting on film. So Milan, Fatima, who shot, uh, Thanksgiving, Hostel One, Milan, and I were like, all right, we gotta move really fast. And just setting up the camera and shooting through there, I mean, it was really, it, it was amazing, you know, I really wanted to keep it from Beth's point of view, and I wanted it to be seductive and beautiful. You know, we kept thinking about what would get the guys to go to Slovakia, okay, the promise of these beautiful women in a land where there's no men, and all that, this kind of male fantasy. So what would get girls to go there? It's the spa, it's beautiful, it's relaxing, you never, and so we tried to make it like lush and seductive, and I remember shooting that shot, and Lauren German is so beautiful, and Vera Jordanova who were in there. Um, it was one of those days where we, we finally got the shots, but by the end, you know, you start your head to toe, I was in my Iceland, 66 degrees north gear, 
But by the end, you know, we all, like the whole crew, we wanted to finish. We finished, we lost the light at like 4.30 or 5. And then we all went, jumped in the blue lagoon and covered ourselves in mud. It was great. It was pretty awesome. I highly recommend shooting at a spa. Because at the end of the day, we all just like went in and we we're like, oh, this is amazing. We're all like getting massage, floating massages in the blue lagoon. But it was stressful because there was no sunlight that day and we were worried we weren't even going to have shootable light. But yeah, I wanted, I always like, I mean, to me, it's like I've had that experience when you're on the subway. And not only do you miss your stop, you wake up and everyone's gone. And you don't know where you are. Like, that's the scariest thing where you're like, just kind of lazily close your eyes and you open your eyes and all your friends are gone. It's completely empty. Like, I wanted that sense of like, what, what did I just, we're so vulnerable when we're asleep and so trusting. And then when you wake up and everything's gone. I really, uh, that's one of my favorite sequences. I really appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate you, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your convention weekend. Thank you guys for being so welcome.